Chapter 1. Dormat's Wait. 30. I had waited too long, even taking into account that he was always late, claiming that lateness was culturally superior to being on time. <laughs> I would have to call. But suddenly, the buzzing of the intercom broke the eerie silence in the flat. The buzzing was beautiful. Like a call for action, it sang dribblings through the air. That insistence is known to me, I thought. The downstairs neighbour, my recycling bins last night, it can't be that. At least her flat had a separate entrance and she had never been given a key to the main building. Or she would have been knocking right on my door. My body jerked up from the bed, almost independently of my brain dictating it to. To grab a t-shirt on the floor. It was cold. The t-shirt smelled of sweat. It could do for the shortest possible conversation between my intercom and the chill of the corridor. My right hand instinctively put up the bedroom blind, but it was too early for light to come in. My neighbor's prize-winning garden was still sitting in shadows. Punctilious horticulturalist, I never to myself. The council is set to cut down on garden waste collection. Her voice pierced through as soon as I pressed. Of course it was her. I praised my instincts. Couldn't she at least greet me or call me by name? I'm leading a very important decision. Can you sign? She loved petitions. Did I care? She thought a girl like me should care. Perhaps she thought a girl like me did care. She clearly saw me as a responsible young lady, a good woman, a good citizen, but that's all that is expected of her. And I want her to be right. I have been too nice to her in the past. Maybe out of loneliness, boredom or pity. Probably out of need. Surely out of habit, politeness had been the bedrock of my upbringing, an instinctive yearn to please. That's why she kept coming back and sitting me out to cut my ink. She would let me sign her petitions in my own blood if I could. Good morning, Sylvia. How lovely of you to think of me. I must be my usual pushover. A little smiley mouse, anger soon mounting on the inside of my own pathetic demeanor. I had to try a bit harder. It's not even seven. She would sense my irritation if I did it right, like mother. A fatal blow delivered with a purr and a smile. Maybe later, I added more firmly, and let my finger on press the button. A fine balance needed to be maintained. Sylvia was a far more annoying neighbor than her mum, who had recently passed away. But she still needed to be kept on my side against the do-it-yourself St. Ikea upstairs. That man's water naturally moved downward, theorist tested me. He had flooded the downstairs flat three times in the last year and turned our address into a war tub. The bathroom started startled me again as I was turning back into the bedroom in a shiver. Certainly, I hadn't done it right. As good as mother, of course. No amount of determination on my side could be enough to keep Sylvia at bay. Everything was set against me. I should have known. Can I leave you with some background information? I'll post it through the door. She hung up. We called back the phone, ran for refuge, back under the doorway. The flat central heating had recently defied repeated rescue interventions but clueless professionals, making me wish I had been to plumbing school rather than go to first in PPE at one of the country's top universities. Mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't blame anybody, really. My pipes must have been over 100 years old. My body felt disheveled, frosty and lonely. I needed a pee. I was upset by my inability to get through my neighbor to make my wish for peace respected. Perhaps I'm overdoing it, I sighed, reconsidering without a conclusion. I have been traveling through anxious, perilous times, fretting over that upcoming call. Something was needed to put me back on track. Maybe a starting the mocha pot in the kitchen at the flat only had carved out of an alcove. The house to flat conversion must have been a big project, but he clearly hadn't touched the plumbing. As I got out of bed and went for the mocha pot, the drain scrunched a little bit by the kitchen radiator, asking for understanding. Mondays are hard for everyone, I nodded in the jelly darkness of the desolate apartment. After a few minutes, the coffee came out of the pot, the hotel cloud filling the tiny space. There was certainly little risk the kitchen would keep everything empty with the sound of flying dogs echoing in the non enormity of its non dome ceiling. I had always aspired to an early kitchen, thought it would materialize one day with the rest of my dreams, but for now I had this tiny alcove. He was definitely an only. I served myself a cup in a well-rehearsed ritual. Next, I stretched my left arm to touch the kitchen ceiling. 
It was easy, despite my body being of medium height with average length upper limbs. <sighs> Another sigh. Perhaps the trickle of the shower would help me in my mood this morning, followed by the frankincense incense cream mother had kindly gifted me last month to help take care of my wrinkles. I had lived in the flat long enough to be long. Yet despite having hoovered the bathroom's carpet to death since moving in, the old silver slippers he left behind remained a must, remained a must before entering the toilet war zone. They were probably the only remnant of our gravitation phase. In this place where everyone wanted me each day, I felt tragic when I thought about it. I finally sat on the board, my right hand holding my only porcelain cup, a prized possession, for the first bee of the day. It's probably unhygienic. He had heard me countless times when we lived together, nearly a year past. But this was my well-rehearsed morning girl, and he was never to change one inch. I guess I had been bred into a woman of habit from early on. I was on of the shower in the dash, trying not to dwell on the usual disappointment, which came away despite shortening the experience. Which came anyway despite shortening the experience. Perhaps because of the peeling bathroom paper, which kept worsening and could not fail to catch my eye, or because of the relentless noise of the water system of both. With the recent settings, even the tiniest water pipe noise unnerved me. I trotted to the bedroom wrapped in towels, convulsing through the chill of the corridor, desperate to indulge on my wardrobe, the only ground feature of the flat, stretching along the bedroom wall and up the high ceiling, looking in the kitchen, high in the bedroom. A space the owner had been unable to exploit because the resulting mezzanine wouldn't have met the requirements for a livable space unless you were a dwarf. Except at this precarious time in my life, I own an unsettling four pairs of jeans, ten flimsy tops, seven budget dresses, and a few selected old outfits I had hung on to for their nostalgic value. I had wanted a clean start, but now the Spartan feel in my wardrobe mausoleum dispirited me. As for his stuff, he had taken every single thing with him, as if he was never coming back. He had left no trace other than the slippers. I needed an uplifting attire this morning, something that could pick up the pieces of my life and put them together better than the mock up cloud, the emotional shower experience, and Mother's Frankincense in sunscreen. There was the one decent designer two piece she had handed down to me some, some years ago a kinky, velvety black trouser suit that had time back been bought by my grandmother, one with shiny black pants and a silk shirt that had belonged to my father when he was very, very thin. I went for it and told myself I looked ravishing as I faced the mirror, all dressed up with nowhere to go. And that was the other thing with the wardrobe. I thought of the mirror head to toe, side to side of my bedroom wall, so that I could fully contemplate the slow motion of my gloriously lonely demise. Eight o'clock, enough. I dialed three times before he picked up. <sighs> Hello? I could barely recognize his voice. It was the deep run of a nightmare. Hi, I said, you don't sound too good. There was a time when I used to adore his early morning brown. I used to adore him over all limits and write long poems savoring his every mannerism. The inside of his brown down to the tiniest trunks nuclear membrane transporter. Woke up a minute ago, his trunks and wants together. Big night? It was the pirate party, he told me. I had told you. I hated pirates and I hated the stop. They were childish. Did you stay late? I asked and stopped myself. He didn't like intrusive. You know these networking events, they are part of the experience. At this point in his life, being an indiscriminate networker was at the top of his agenda. He seemed caught in a freak networking is strong. Before that, he had forever been a perfectionist at work, which took most of his time and effort, and a strong will, which seemed absent from our relationship. He appears certain that our relationship needed little input in the of his own intelligence, perhaps even without us. He paused. Maybe he was trying to sit up wherever he was. I thought I heard an attempt from him to clear his throat. In a couple of months, he'll be all over, he added, not in a reassuring tone, though, but as if announcing Armageddon, no traces of joy for our potential reunion, which would hopefully come as a byproduct. He had fallen in love with me once, with us, but perhaps he has only fallen in love with the way people have photographed us, and he thought that image could last forever. Has it been that good? I knew I shouldn't push it, that it was better to remain calm, but it was hard not to be cynical. 
Maybe I should do an MBA too. It was pure bravado. Go for it. He knew he hated. But his answers were always so practical. They followed a logic. He offered a straightforward, simple solutions that, by my own logic, should have stopped me moaning. I couldn't deny it. Perhaps it was my fault, and I could be convinced that at some point, my love had become too big, and our time for it insufficient. And although I had tried to add issues, it always happened in an undiluted, non-urgent way. Even when my mental breakdown had been imminent, when the mending had been urgent, and it had always been dismissed as abstract talk, entirely my fault for being a doormat, perhaps. We are together in a few weeks, I ventured more cheerfully. I thought whether I should fill the silence with the story of Sylvia's wake-up call and abandon the idea almost immediately. It was irrelevant, but on second thoughts, I may have been what made it suitable. It's been tough this past month, you know, I added. I added instead, uh, ra raging inside me for something so needy. I love to think about him and the wedding. He thought he had time, but he had time. It was just that he couldn't make time for me. It seemed to me I had more time every time and he had less time to make time. We had boarded the same train long ago, but I had ended up on a couple carriage on a side track. Maybe I had put myself there. Perhaps he was quite to him over to my side, but then he was off. And the farther he went, the more I loved him. The more I wanted him. But the more I loved him, the less I saw him. I had tried to put a definite stop to it with my mental breakdown forcing the engagement. But he went on anyway. Is your mother all over it? The one person he feared but constantly brought up these days. Who wouldn't fear her, even if she adored him back? And thought he was the best thing that had happened to me, especially after the other thing that had happened, the breakdown. He had self exiled himself unjustly. He would disagree after my breakdown. But mother had, of course, fully approved of his decision to leave me to do his MBA. Not so much of mine to abandon my job to follow him and then failing to stick by him. He's right to fight for his way out, he had said at the, top, at the time. It was daunting to what extent my plan had backfired. I had been promised a wedding, but I had not secured the man. And had I been a different kind of woman, I would still be throwing tantrums for his attention in the most public places with the fewest exits. And I was just a pushover, always waiting for him to call. She's fretting over my sister's wedding for the moment, I replied to tranquilize him, although he didn't deserve it. I thought I heard a few on the other end of the line. But she still inundates me with plenty of unwelcome clips. I haven't even told her yet that we're going for Asia, for an Asian venue, I added. She will definitely complain that we're only doing it to escape her, to get away with carrots and a wedding cake. I knew Mother was waiting for me to suck it. But I also knew the moment I asked for her help, she would take over. And yet if I didn't ask her, she would never pardon me. It was a usual impossible situation, and he had been rightly suggested Asia may make things easier. The choice was justifiable. He was studying in Singapore, and there was a possibility he would stay on to work there and that we would settle abroad temporarily. We had decided all of it together, me and him, as far as I remembered. Are you okay? Out of the blue, he was suddenly caring. I wonder if that was as much love as he was going to give me that morning, and passionate pot plant. My inability to be at the center of his world worked me like a hot iron from the inside. I have a few wedding venues lined up if you want to talk about them, I said. It was my sudden urge to punish him. The middle of the prayer and the smile had I done it right this time? Let's do it when you're over, he said, trying to sound enthusiastic. He was always so sensible. What day you land? Sensible but unromantic. How could he not remember when I was landing? Did he not be waiting for me at the airport with a bunch of roses bigger than his head? He knew how to make me furious, to remind me of my relative place in his universe, to leave me always hungry for more. But at any sign of my health, he would tell me to stop being anxious, to stop being unreasonable. He didn't wait for my answer. Sorry, I need to go now. Let's catch up later. Love you. He didn't mean it. Just battering his exit, I was almost certain. Take care, I whispered. And I wondered if he felt as flat as I did enraged by his flatness. But of course, he hadn't noticed anything. But he thought he was making me happy. I had remained welcoming, pretty and fat. He's lucky. And it suited him. Perhaps in a way, it suited me too. Next, I picked up my swimming bag, ready by the entrance door, and grabbed the old coat. 
hang on a semi-antique brass hook I had bought at a Portobello Road stall when I first moved in. I threw it over my shoulders, cursing how much the garment needed a trip to the dry cleaners. My creator is definitely conjuring against me this morning, I thought, and came out of the building without a hat or umbrella, ready to bully the weather, having trodden on Sylvia's petition papers she had left for me under the building store. <laughs> mm -hmm.